Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, Useful Tools for Diamond Lovers. My name is John Pollard. I am Senior Director of Education for the International Gemological Institute, an educational advisor for Pricescope.com, and your host for the In the Loop webinar series. By way of introduction, Pricescope is the world's largest diamond and jewelry community with over 100,000 registered members teaching consumers how to buy diamonds for more than 20 years. Today's topic will provide insight on the most common tools for consumers during the diamond and jewelry buying process, from charts to loops, gauges and calipers to gem testers and more. We'll also share some insight on some more advanced tools for the veteran hobbyists and briefly touch on a short list of useful tools for pros. After that, I'm going to invite in the loop regulars, Diamond Concierge Dave Atlas and developer of the patented HCA and Ideal Scope, Mr. Gary Holloway, to join me for some experienced context, some context uh, comments, useful tips, and some interesting anecdotes from their long experience with all kinds of tools. Throughout the session, we invite your questions. We've scheduled time to address that at the end. We'll also be providing a series of links to online resources via the chat in the live session, We'll duplicate those links in the webinar description on YouTube uh, when this session is over for anybody watching later on demand. Before we get started, I'd like to clarify what this session is and what it isn't. This is largely about shopping, analyzing, and buying diamond jewelry. The session is not about colored gemstone buying or shopping. And while colored gemstone identification, treatment detection, and analysis may get some of our viewers excited, it's a dense enough topic that we'll need to cover it in its own session. There's an argument to be made that today's online buyers don't need tools if they select the right seller. Essentially, this means you're making the selected vendor your tool of choice. And if that's the case, it's important to select a reliable tool. To that end, I will briefly mention the vetted price scope vendors. These are sellers who are well proven in time in four C's and finished jewelry quality offerings, as well as two-way shipping covered, a practical in-person inspection, and the ability to return or exchange products. If you are using a vendor as your tool, you just need to determine which one specializes in the balance of product quality, service, and value you're seeking individually. You can find a full list of vendors in the PriceScope resources menu, and these webinars are brought to you by PriceScope sponsors and supporters. I should also mention the PriceScope forum is a tool unto itself with no shortage of input and opinion all offered honestly. If you're not yet registered for PriceScope, you'll find links on the forum and in the video description if you're watching it on demand. Let's talk about tools useful to all diamond shoppers. The first one is a chart to correlate the carat weight of a round brilliant diamond to its side to side millimeter spread so that you're not going to buy one cut too deep or too shallow. Now this is only useful for round brilliance, but the vast majority of shoppers still purchase that shape. So it's relevant here. We have a link to such a printable chart in the price scope education section, which will be in the chat and the video description. Do note this chart is a conservative guide, meaning it's a best case scenario. As carat weights get higher, it's harder to find these spreads, so treat the chart we're linking as somewhat strict. Next, for round brilliance again, different proportion sets have different character. Fortunately, proportions measurements can be used to draw certain conclusions about a diamond's likely appearance. We have a link to add here as well to a price scope education page describing proportions, and the chart is available as a PDF on that page. Finally, for round brilliant shoppers, you can avoid average and poor performing diamonds by entering a few measurements from any round or its report number into the patented HCA for an analysis of how it fares compared to other round brilliants. New users get a few results for free, and all users can see free results for every round diamond in the price scope search engine. We have a link to the HCA page to add here as well. For fancy shape searches, due to all the variables in fancy shapes, uh, such charts, uh, charts rather are really not possible. We urge you to use a vetted seller or even use the price scope forum 
as your primary tool in checking out fancy shapes. So let's move on to tools for viewing loose diamonds in all shapes. First, either a pair of gemstone tweezers, or since tweezers take some time to master, a transparent comparison plate with insets. Now, tweezers are widely available. The comparison plate is available from datlas.com, and we have a link to that page, which again, we will provide. A gemstone polishing cloth is important, and it's very important to use before each viewing because dirt and grease likes to stick to stones, even while they're being passed around uh, uh, loose. Um, so even in the same session, make sure you use it quite liberally. A ring plunger or spring rings are like tweezers. Uh, the tweezers uh, holding the diamond in context, however. Spring rings are especially useful for seeing how the stone might look in context on the finger. The ideal scope is next. Now, this is a cut quality assessment tool for round diamonds. It has a cousin, the asset scope, which is more suitable for fancies. Uh, we have links to share to where these tools can be acquired, either from idealscope.com and datlas.com. We also covered the ideal scope thoroughly in a previous In the Loop webinar, which we will link in the chat and in the description on YouTube if you want more information on that. Finally, for use with the diamond comparison plate and ideal scope, a mobile phone with a white screen is really useful. If you don't have a white screen setting, YouTube has you covered. We actually have a link to a 24 hour white screen video, which we're sharing with you, which you can bring up on your phone and use with those tools. Now, as you consider this list, also consider the pros and cons of tools. Pros, when you come into a store, professional jewelers might take a keener interest if you're using tools. It marks you as someone who's more invested or informed than the average shopper. In reputable places, this should work to your advantage. The cons are that tools are useless if you don't know what you're doing. In addition to practicing with tweezers and cloths and picking up diamonds carefully from a flat surface using plungers and spring rings, you should always know what you're looking for once you get them up. Now you can do it yourself to a certain degree, but at some point it's good to consult those with experience to maximize your results. Here again, Price Scope is here to help you. The forum is filled with veteran shoppers and professionals who will gladly assist with usage instructions and tips for any of these tools and the ones we will discuss next. I'd like to remind participants to send questions our way during this session. We have scheduled time to address them at the end. Now I'd like to move to tools that more experienced jewelry enthusiasts tend to invest in. First is the standard 10 power jewelers loop. And do note that most loops sold online as 10 power are not actually 10 power, so it's important to get a reliable and proven product. Additionally, the best jewelry loops come with black framing around the lens. Why black? Because black color eliminates other colors in the environment which could reflect back from a shiny frame and change the color of the object that you're viewing. I would like to call out two loops with a legacy of longtime recommendation on the Price Scope forum. Uh, we have a link to the Belomo triplet loop, which currently costs around $35. It's extremely clear with a very wide viewing area of 21 millimeters. We also have a link to the Nikon 10 power loop. It's the choice of many seasoned professionals and diamond tears. It sells for around $100. Now it has a smaller lens, just 13 millimeters wide. So many people find the Belomo more user-friendly, especially as an entry-level tool. Another user-friendly tool with some bonus features is the lighted loop featuring LED as well as ultraviolet light. And we have a link to where these as well as a number of beginner tools are available uh, for $35 on datlas.com. That lighted loop, which is the $35 tool, comes with one extra set of batteries. And for those who like to check inscriptions, a 20 to 30 power loop is super useful. 
Uh, 20 power is enough for most people, and it's far easier to use. Uh, 30 power takes some time to accommodate to, but it's more useful for finding inscriptions on small stones. Finally, suitable for any enthusiast, the home ultrasonic cleaner. This, by the way, makes a great gift if somebody doesn't have it yet. Uh, many brands exist uh, from rather inexpensive to very expensive. And here again, we suggest you ask for recommendations on the Price Scope Forum. And for those watching live, let's make this interactive. Uh, we invite you to drop links to your favorite loops, ultrasonic cleaners, tweezers, and other tools in the chat. And if you wish, you can return to the thread about this webinar on Price Scope and add that information there. I am obligated to mention that neither I nor Price Scope specifically endorse items crowdsourced from participants. However, we have some pretty smart people in the community. Now let's move to hobbyists engaged in buying loose stones secondhand. Now they'll find these advanced tools useful. First, a diamond tester. These won't distinguish between natural and lab-grown diamonds, but they will separate diamond from simulants like moissanite and CZ. Do be aware, these are prone to false positives and negatives. Gary Holloway is going to discuss that more when he joins us later in the session. A millimeter gauge or jewelry calipers are super useful for measuring dimensions. The jewelry caliper is designed to measure depth of mounted stones when the culet is accessible. And I'd like to give a shout out to the reliable Bernier caliper used in many applications outside jewelry if you prefer one. A UV light for checking fluorescence and phosphorescence in natural and lab-grown diamonds could be important. Do note that the wavelength needs to be around 390 nanometers, not 365. On the jewelry side of the diamond hobbyist equation, a sizing mandrel is useful for determining and matching ring sizes, and you'll want to pair it with a ring sizing set. If you're using this with other people, a comfort fit set is rounded on the inside, generally more comfortable and feels more normal, so it better simulates what they have experience with. There's an important note here, sizers differ from place to place. So if you're having jewelry created, be sure the fabricator of the piece and you are on the same page about size. If you're working uh, from long distance, you might have them send you a set of plastic sizers so you can find the one that correlates to how your sizer fits your mandrel, just to be sure everything's properly, uh, properly calibrated rather. And finally, a loose gemstone case and possibly a travel jewelry case with protected spaces for finished jewelry. So this is basically our sum up of interesting jewelry that uh, takes us from beginner level all the way to those who are hobbyists and collectors. And securing these items is easier than ever in today's e-commerce friendly world, Googling the term Diamond and gemstone tools will bring up a number of professional suppliers. With that said, diamond supply places don't always have the most consumer friendly prices, so you can cross reference those listings with identical items in online marketplaces to see what works best for you. You can always ask the members of the Price Scope Forum, and those participating here are invited to post recommendations in the thread about the webinar. Uh, we have a link to that thread in the chat and we'll put it in the video description. I'll close this section by listing a few more advanced tools. Now, these are not usually items consumer hobbyists would need, but they may be of interest. <clears throat> First, a carat and gram scale with windscreens. Now, consumers often buy portable scales, but you should be aware that they're generally only accurate to about 0.02 carats. You can also see a gemological microscope with dark field and reflective viewing. Uh, today's jewelry professionals are adding a type two screening tool, which separates natural diamonds in the normal color range from those which uh, are type two, thus might be lab grown. Next is a diamond sorting pad, which you'll find in diamond offices around the world, a slotted tray for comparing multiple loose gemstones and a professional quality steam cleaner. By the way, if you're a hobbyist, you can use a good espresso milk steamer for steam cleaning. Finally, for gemologists and graders, this list includes tools for gemstone identification, treatment detection, crystal structure analysis, and much more. Consumers, 
and even most jewelers will find it more cost effective to send their gemstone to a reliable grading laboratory or a super equipped appraiser to have these assessments professionally done. That's going to bring us to our group session with Dave Atlas and Gary Holloway. We've put a lot on the screen. To some jewelry enthusiasts, it may even qualify as uh, eye candy. But before you break the bank, I would like to ask Dave Atlas, affectionately known as Old Miner, to join us and provide some context about the array of tools we've just seen. Dave? Uh, okay, got me blocked on video. Yes, our host will have to give you permission to show us uh, your charismatic and handsome face. Okay, here we go. Perfect. Okay. Well, I have a whole bunch of equipment that I travel with or that I use in my lab. Uh, and a lot of it you mentioned, uh, the loops, the ver variety of loops. Uh, I started to dig around to see what I had uh, here and in my uh, desk drawers and things like that things that uh, I don't want to throw away, but I rarely use uh, because I, you get your favorite tools after a while. But uh, I do have uh, a good size, uh, fairly large loop that Gary and I used to uh, sell to people. Uh, it's a pretty big loop. It's kind of like the Belomo size loop. I also have a Nikon. Uh, most of the time when I go anywhere, I... Uh, I just travel with one that I can wear around my neck and it doesn't have any case or anything to interfere with it. It keeps it as small and light as possible. Uh, and it makes it uh, a useful tool. It's probably the thing that every diamond dealer spends the most time with is the loop in one eye all the time looking at stones. Uh, of course, I travel with a portable master set and uh, I'll try and hold it up a little bit and see if anything can get into that screen. I don't know. I see it on the screen, but I don't know how clear it is. But there's 10 stones in it, nine of which are uh, graded by GIA as master stones uh, from a number of different sets that were available to me over the years. People... Uh, get a new set and want to sell an old set or uh, somebody passed away and you can buy a used set. But there's really only one place that I know of at all that you can even uh, get a new set. They're very expensive. Uh, however, for a person that's beginning, there are uh, CZ sets that are useful but can be a little dangerous. They can be dangerous because they have a tendency to fade and change color. And it can happen after you have it for months, all of a sudden one day there's two stones that don't work anymore in the set. They've, they've altered and you can't change them back. And if you don't have any diamonds to use to grade their new color, those stones come out of the set. They're useless at that time. Although you hang on to them, sometimes uh, they stabilize at the new color and maybe uh, you'll be able to get them color graded and use them uh, wherever they belong. What I've done in previous sets where I had employees, everyone used CZ sets so that it wouldn't be a tragedy if they fell on the floor. Uh, and what we did was we always stuck at least one or two diamonds that we knew the color of into the set. And every morning, each employee would take the set they used and make sure that everything made sense every day, that nothing had faded. And you could rely upon the idea that the two diamonds that were the control stones in the set never would fade. So it controlled the whole set and they would have a good reliance that the set would be working set. So that's a, a good suggestion for anyone is to make that investment at least one or two GIA graded stones at, at the worst, not necessarily master diamonds, but at least a couple of small diamonds that you're absolutely aware of the color. And 
if your CZs would fade, you could use that to uh, make yourself aware. Otherwise, it's, it can be very subtle and you won't know. Uh, I have uh, the typical calipers that uh, we discussed, one of which uh, is a little bit unique. It's one of the Minitoyo uh, slide calipers. And I use the end uh, to get into the sides of stones that are set in prongs or to estimate the width. Sometimes you have to do that. And to do that, sometimes you need an eye loop. I put this over my glasses. My father, who didn't need uh, glasses so much, used to stick it right in his face and uh, hold it in with his eye. Uh, these are good things to have in addition. One thing we didn't mention was that if you buy a uh, one of these type of uh, caliper tools, but not necessarily this one, the circular kind that we saw a picture of, uh, they come in both digital and analog. And the analog ones can be quite accurate. And the electronic ones eventually uh, get wear and tear on the gear, so they really can't be adjusted very well. And the analog ones may wear out, but they're a lot less expensive. And they really work fine, and you don't need to worry about a battery going dead on the moment that you uh, need to use it. So it's a, it, it's a good alternative, and you can often buy the analog tools used, uh, and they continue to work for years and years, and they may be off a tenth or two, and once you have a, uh, you can get a gauge block and know exactly how it's reading, and you can make adjustments for that. So they're very useful, and they're inexpensive tools. Uh, I have exactly the same, uh, Moissanite diamond CZ checker tool, and that works on heat dissipation, uh, thermal probe. And because some moissanite now will not show itself as moissanite to that particular tool, I have a little polariscope. This is the typical inexpensive polariscope that people will buy, and sometimes it's mounted on a uh, small mag light and it, it unfortunately the problem is it's too small you can't get anything that's mounted into the into the, the scope and then turn things well this one's twice as big in terms of the lensing and what's really great about it it folds up it falls flat and so you can carry it in a very nice little pouch and use it uh, for all sorts of identification work. And the nicest thing about it, moissanite will show up as doubly refractive. And I, that may be beyond the scope of what we're doing, but it's an easy way to detect moissanite when everything else fails. And so a little tool like this, it's good to learn where you can apply it, even in the diamond world, which would be a very unusual source. Uh, you can tell a lot about stones, uh, whether they're man-made or mined in terms of diamonds, with uh, the layers that are made visible by polarized light. And there, there are simple books on the subject, and it will help you greatly if you really get involved uh, to understand the use of the polariscope along with other means of detection of man-made stones because there, there certainly are going to be more and more of them in the market and uh, being put into jewelry that you would never think it was there, but there it is. Uh, I have one of the uh, basic detection tools. You put a stone in heat in uh, under this little, onto this little platform and you close it, you power it up. And if it lets the, the uh, shortwave UV through the stone, uh, you know that you have a type 2A stone, uh, and 2As are all the mine, or all the lab diamonds, and only a small percentage of natural stones. So it's a good screening device. 
there's just many cases where you can't possibly do that. Uh, we got, I use a lot of uh, ultraviolet light in the work that I do because people are concerned about UV fluorescence, can have an effect on price, can have an effect on appearance. Uh, and I have all sorts of them. I have a couple that are uh, actually visible light and they're laser uh, tools. And they, one produces 430 nanometer light, which is well into the visible range. One produces 400 nanometer light that looks the same as this one. This, uh, this older tool is a 395. That's the same one that we had in the picture going in. And I found these for sale several years ago. It was one of the first ones I'd ever seen. It's a single pen light battery and a single LED, and it's dead on 365. So I have the whole shoot match of, of so different you ones. Got, you, could, you could do a rock band show because you got enough lights for that. I got so, enough light. So, and, Dave, I got you yeah. surprised me a bit here. I thought that you might jump in by saying, first of all, you don't need all of the tools that we're describing usually, but instead, uh, you're basically you're going to turn our audience into appraisers, man. Uh, well, <laughs> you don't need all these tools. And like I said, I was digging through my drawers here today uh, in the desk. I don't throw things away because once in a blue moon, you need something you rarely use. Uh, the primary tool is the loop, the tweezer and the master set and that's the primary tools and most of that is a, a learned process and almost everyone needs a, a forum like PriceScope where they need a, a really skilled uh, gemologist or jeweler to mentor them for 25 minutes four or five times to learn how to use the tools. Yeah it's also by the way uh, you mentioned of course and, and the CZ master set is a lot more practical than trying to go out and get a, a, a oh, an actual. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's good also to practice on CZs, you know, practice manipulating tweezers, practice looping and all those kinds of things. Yes. It's, it's good to practice on, um, on simulants. And then when you get to the real deal, you've got experience. And if you chipped something along the way, it's okay. Um, Dave, that was, that was thorough and um i'm sure we'll hear from you we got a couple story times ahead but i did want to invite gary in at this point oh, um mr okay. holloway uh has some interesting tests and some things you can do uh with or sans tools mr holloway are you there for us hello hi gary firstly mia culpa um, I was going to do this um, at work and I have amassed about 20 little tools and things that I was going to show, but um, because of time zones and things, um, it was seven o'clock here, not nine o'clock. So uh, mea culpa, apologies. <coughs> Tweezers. Um, the ones that we sell on Idealscope have little sliders so that you can pick the stones up and what, um, what, um, John was just saying, it's a very good idea to practice with CZs because uh, when you do your first lessons in gemology, um, there are stones flying all around the place um, <clears throat> because you do them up too tightly. So you do them up only just tight enough so that they can hold the stone, which is why these little gadgets are kind of easier. Um, so <clears throat> firstly, I wanna show you the breath test. Here I have a little collection of diamonds. There we are. Now, if I was to go and breathe on them, some of the stones were CZ and some were diamonds. The diamonds will unfrost um, in about a second. The CZs will stay frosted for five to 10 seconds. It's better if you put them on a heat conducting surface, so a telephone screen, and it works better on a darker surface usually than a lighter colored surface. You obviously need good light though. 
So that's the simplest um, and the quickest. And uh, in the diamond course that I did many, many years ago, um, I was able to sort the parcels of stones that they gave us um, in seconds while people were picking up stones and doing all sorts of other tests. So speed is, as Dave will tell you, a very, very important factor. <coughs> very simple. Well, and by the way, that doesn't work with moissanite. It only works with CZ because moissanite also conducts heat very, very effectively, as does sapphire and ruby. So the next thing is the read-through test. So one puts um, the stone onto uh, a piece of paper with a dot or some writing, move the stone across the top, and you can practice this with the CZs. If you've ever bought the, the ideal scope with the CZ, you'll have one. Um, you can slide the stone across the writing and you will see that you can see the writing flashing through underneath. If you do that with a round diamond, um, you'll be able to see almost no writing underneath the stone. So that's a very, very simple test called the read through or the blue dot test or whatever you want to call it. Um, however, it's not terribly effective with most fancy shaped diamonds because most fancy shaped diamonds leak too much light. And because what we're doing is actually doing a leakage test. Surprise, surprise. <coughs> so um, UV torches, um, a couple of things about UV torches. If you do have a master set, don't ever let the UV shine on your CZs if you've got the cheap master set, because the UV is what makes the diamonds fade or the cubic zirconias fade. Um, so you are actually best to keep them in a dark place, in a, a box with a dark with a covered lid. Um, if you buy the common ones that have the transparent lid, it's a good idea to put a bit of black paper over the top of it so that you don't get the light going through the plastic because that plastic won't stop much UV light, which was unfortunately one of the tests that I was going to show you at the shop. <clears throat> so um, I have here two pair of sunglasses. They are Polaroid sunglasses. Dave showed you um, a sophisticated little machine, but if you've got a pair of old Polaroid sunglasses or buy a pair of cheapies, and you'll see that if you turn them like that, you can see through them. Now you can't see through them. You can see through them, you can't see through them. So the uh, polariscope that Dave was showing you um, is effectively a really, really good way to test. So if you take the lenses out, and you hold over the top of the lens your loop. So I can't, of course, do this, but uh, effectively, this is what you're going to be doing and looking through um, and turn the bottom piece, or if you have a little light to put that on on your phone, um, then turn the stone with the tweezers. And if it lights up and goes dark, lights up and goes dark every 90 degrees, what you're going to know is that that is probably a moissanite. That's a really, really simple moissanite test. Um, so uh, the CZs and the diamonds won't go dark light. They will stay more or less the same color. But if you have a diamond that you are thinking of having recut, you can also do a really safe mm. test. And that is to make sure that the diamond doesn't have lots and lots of stress zones in it. Now, if you've ever worn Polaroid sunglasses and you've looked through old car windows, not the recent ones, but the older car windows, you see all those funny little colors. So that's what we're talking about. It's the stress in the diamond creates these little rainbowish like colors, They're actually not rainbow colors, they're called dispersion colors, but um, if you see lots and lots of that going on in your diamond, there is a greater risk that the diamond will chip and break. It's also down. interesting that, that um, it's useful, by the way, uh, <laughs> in terms of um, identification of, of a number of things. When, when by the way, when uh, let me do a little uh, translation for our multinational audience. Uh, when Dave and Gary talk about polariscope, it's cross-polarized filters. Uh, okay, so that's why the term polariscope is there. And then when Gary says CZ, that's Australian for CZ. 
So just so we're, uh, we're clear on all that. Um, gents, uh, I wanted to hear, I remember Dave- Just, just a second, just a second, John. Yep. Um, the other thing is that if you happen to have uh, be a, a photography fan, um, the, the Polaroid filter on the, mm -hmm. that you screw onto the front of your lens is an absolutely beautiful um, Polaroid device. Um, and you may be able to see, if I put this right over the, you may be able to see me going dark and light, dark and light. Yes, sir. Okay, so you want it to be dark. Okay, Gemolo so. Gemology hacks for everyone. I mm -hmm. love it. Um, cool, so I, want, I did want to shout back to Dave for a second because I do remember Dave at one si at time saying that a flashlight is sometimes a required tool, just a regular old flashlight. Sure, absolutely. I, I have had uh, a small LED flashlight that I carry, and this one is highly variable. It goes from extremely bright to dim uh, so that you can use it the way you need to, to light from the top, light from the side, light the polariscope if you need to, because the polariscope needs light coming through it. Uh, and it, it stands on its own, so it makes it easy to use. Uh, that's for sure. And uh, I do carry a, uh, an incandescent uh, small mag light with me as well. Sometimes the light from an LED is not suitable and you need uh, the kind of spectrum that comes out of a, a more uh, traditional lighting source. All useful when traveling, uh, also useful when traveling around flea markets, is it not? Yeah, 3 a.m. and buying in, uh, in, the, uh, in the rain at some place or uh, out in the dark, and all you have is a loop and a flashlight. Well, there you go. You can find yeah. your way around. Okay, oh, yeah. so... Um, we have a few comments and questions that have come in, and guys, if you're ready for that, uh, if you have nothing else, then I'd like to move on to that. Um, first thing I did want to say, I saw that uh, one of our uh, veteran contributors had also noted in the comments to practice with CZ, so that's great, because that's uh, someone who came from the consumer side of the counter. Uh, I was taught to do that as well, so great to have that reinforced. Um, Next question is this, if the efficacy of gem testers is so debatable, then why are they so popular? Let me go to Gary first for that and then I'll hear Dave. Okay, <clears throat> I hide them from my staff. Um, every time I go into um, <clears throat> the gem room or the, the one of the, my other store, um, I just take them and I hide them because I don't like people using them. Um, it's far safer in the case of a moissano um, to look at the stone on the angle that you can see me looking at now, uh, the doubling of the back facets. So you need to look through on a bit of an angle and you look at the culet through the kite facets and what you'll see is two of everything. If you see that, it's not a diamond. It's also not a CZ. Um, because of the double refraction that causes the going dark, going light, going dark on the polariscope, um, that is the safest way to identify um, a moissano. Um, a cubic zirconia, the safest way is to just look at it because if you've looked at a few diamonds, um, they look completely different. And you can make that decision. Um, <clears throat> Um, most of my staff um, who are not gemologists can identify a cubic zirconia ring, um, especially when it's dirty. The dirtier it is, the more likely you are to see a stone that looks like it's had the, the, the pavilion separated from the crown and a drop of milk, a bit of water, and it looks like it's milky, white, hazy, um, and so there are simple, simple ways that you can identify these stones and you won't get caught. Dave, same question. Why, uh, why do people recommend the, the testers if they're not 100%? Well, you, you won't get confused between a CZ and a, and a diamond with a tester. The tester will test that reliably. The moissanite 
the, the newest boys that I could get by virtually all the testers. And I understand it could get by some of the testers that are supposed to detect it. And that, that really poses a problem. I think Gary's solution is, is an elegant one because that double refraction shows if you know where to look. Uh, however, I do like the tester because uh, I do uh, some watch appraising. And uh, this tester that we're talking about, the Presidium 3, will detect the sapphire crystal on watches. Uh, it can tell, tell you that you have uh, a garnet, a spinel, or a ruby uh, without too much effort. Uh, and of course, there's other gemological tests that are absolutely easy enough to do. But there's things with the tester that are valuable. Uh, and it, it's just an efficient way to detect a couple of things. Uh, but I rarely need it for diamond detection. Uh, CZ doesn't look like a diamond to me. Never did. Moissanite looks something like a diamond, but it has more fire than a normal diamond. Uh, if I'm relaxed and not being rushed, I don't think it's going to get past me, but I do test occasionally. Uh, it's not my main tool, that's for sure. Yeah, so it's, in my case, uh, when I was um, taking in a lot of um, different OTC for recuts and, and things like that, I agree with you in the sense that you can, if you've seen enough diamond, you recognize diamond from the closest uh, simulants. Um, so... I would always use the Presidium 3, though, just it was part of my routine. And even if it said diamond, my next test was to loop it and uh, indeed check for double refraction because it had been disqualified as a CZ. Well, let's just make sure it's not a fancy moissanite. Um, it's no different, actually, than, than the Type 2 testers right now, which essentially now we're I'm shifting to talking about detecting uh, lab-grown diamonds versus natural, which is in play even for consumer hobbyists these days. Um, the type two testers that are out there, they're certainly not inexpensive, but they are now, uh, thankfully, available to most jewelers. Uh, what they do is they will tell you if a diamond is a type two diamond. And in, in the normal color range, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a lab grown diamonds, but what it basically does is says it needs further testing. And since very, very few natural diamonds are type two, then you can send it to the lab for testing. The bonus is maybe it comes back as a natural type 2A and you win-win. Yes, I, I mean, that's one of the reasons that I've invested in more uh, exotic tools to determine if I have a, a man-made stone or a, a natural or a mine stone. And uh, there are more definitive tests that you can do, but you really have to start investing money in it. Sure. Gary, did you have something there? Yeah, well, well, the simple, cheap UV torch. Um, a couple of things about the simple, cheap UV torch. Um, if you have a ring and it's got 10 stones in it, um, some of those stones are going to fluoresce. So you would know that at least some of the diamonds in that ring um, are going to be diamonds, natural diamonds. Um, <clears throat> so that's a, so you're going to expect with a cheap UV torch, um, GAA tell us that, that somewhere around 35% of diamonds or 25%, depending on who you believe, um, fluoresce. In actual fact, um, GAA for many, many decades have been using the gemological frequency, which is 365 nanometers, which is a little bit dangerous if you shine it in your eyes. You can get sunburned almost from it. Um, that is the wrong frequency to use for a diamond. So in actual fact, you'll get about twice as much fluorescence out of a diamond with a cheap UV torch. So diamonds that have been graded as faint will look like they're medium. Sometimes even they'll look like they're strong. Yeah, so, proximity, proximity is also important <coughs> area the test. Of course, them. of course, because they're, they're very low amperage, very low wattage. But if you shine that over the top of any ring, 
you know, any any stone, um, you're going to see way, way, way more stones fluorescing than 25 or 35%. Quite often you'll see about a half of the stones starting to show some semblance of fluorescence because almost all diamonds have got some nitrogen in them and it's the nitrogen that makes them fluoresce. So um, <clears throat> that's just, that's just a, a really, really simple, and you can buy those things for $5. Oh. And the cheaper they are, the more fluorescence they produce. Okay, very nice. Um, we have several more questions. I saw one uh, come in that I think is uh, probably real good for right now. Uh, what happens if you have a non-diamond that's coated with diamond, um, not doubly or triply uh, in terms of refraction, but, uh, but coated? I don't believe them. You don't believe in diamond coatings? No. I, um, I purchased a piece once and sent it off to uh, Melbourne University, um, had it tested and they couldn't find any carbon. Wow. Wow. So it, uh, it, it may be, that was probably about uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. It may be that they are doing it but um, I don't believe that there is enough diamond uh, to fill a Presidium 3 if the Presidium 3 wasn't already going to be filled. I, I think, okay, so we're talking about the heat conductivity test is, is what you're referring to. So it's an interesting question because, you know, there a couple of years ago, there was a, a scandal that took place um, at one of the major labs uh, where apparently a number of site holders were suddenly banished from ever sending their diamonds there again and it supposedly had to do with the mysterious coating. I'm only bringing it up in absolute rumor because it was never really disclosed um, what exactly went down but we were just we just heard the term mysterious coating. Never heard anything after that and was not aware of diamond coatings before that but didn't know if any of you had experience. I thought it. I thought it was a, a story about coatings that somewhat altered the color of the stones. Oh, you can do that. Yeah, there's. I mean, you can put an ink drop on. Oh well, no, a coatings, a diamond coating of a different color on the surface of a of a diamond, and that it somehow improved the color a grade or two. It's uh, the bloom. Yeah, I'm sure, the strain it would show. That that is the bloom that they put on lenses which produces that bluish effect oh, yeah. that you, you see. And so putting that uh, scented balloon on the, on the pavilion side, um, the blue cancels out the yellow and improves the color. Yeah. That's, been, that's been around a long time, um, uh, along with all sorts of other things like uh, ink and blue foil and, and so on. Yeah. Okay, gentlemen, um, another one. If the three of you could only take one diamond tool to a remote diamond island um, to do your analysis, what would it be? And I'm going to qualify this and say they're all natural diamonds, so we don't have to sift out the, the lab grown from the, the natural. All right, De uh, Gary, clearly you're volunteering. Well, I'd, I would take the ideal scope um, lid that we sell that's got um, a UV light, um, a light in it so that you can actually front light the diamonds. Um, the front lighting is, is useful sometimes to see some types of inclusions. You can see, for example, if you have a twinned diamond and you turn the front light on, um, you can see what that twinned light diamond is going to look like um, when you set it in a ring. Is that because yeah. of the graining, the graining becomes telltale? The <clears throat> thing with twinning is that um, you can often find a diamond um, that GIA have failed in terms of clarity, so an SI1, SI2, um, and the only thing that is in it is the twinning. Um, the way GIA grade diamonds is, of course, they start looking at every facet um, through a microscope. And when you backlight the, the twinned diamond, um, it really, really looks terrible. When you frontlight it, um, you can often not see anything 
and often that twinning is doing very, very little to dull the dharma. So I would say um, to anybody who says, oh, I've got a dharma that GIA made a mistake, that's almost always a cloudy diamond, um, and cut nut like me hates cloudy diamonds. Um, we don't like hazy milky. But twinning um, is sometimes you can get an absolute ripper SI2, um, and the best way to check it is to front light it. And when you're looking with a loop, you can't front light. So that little white light on the front of the loop is fantastic. And of course, it's got the UV light as well. Okay. And that UV light has both the globe and it's got the UV all the way around the stone. So you can do all sorts of things with that. Not Front lighting that. also useful during campfire trades on the remote island. Um, <laughs> Dave, yeah. what about yourself? I, 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 I agree with Gary. I think uh, the loop with the, the lighting built in would be the, the ideal uh, item to take to buy diamonds in the worst of conditions where you only can take one small oh, thing. Yeah. Sounds All right. good. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and disagree with you guys. I'm gonna go ahead and take my serene scanner. Uh, and maybe oh. I'll up with one of you guys with a loop after I corner the, the diamond market on cut on that island. How about that? <laughs> uh, cool. So coming down to the last couple questions. Uh, I thought about that, Gary. Yeah. Um, at what point would you advise an average consumer to consult a professional at, at whatever, what point of confusion, I suppose the question is about? Would you, would you tell somebody they probably need to, to consult a professional before going further? Either one. If the diamond uh, looks too good uh, to be true. That's great. If a deal yeah. looks too good to be true, yep. Yeah, if the clarity looks too good um, and you're not experienced and you don't know how to look for haziness and, and all of those things, um, um, you know, you've got a, an SI1 diamond and it's got just this VS1 inclusion in it, um, definitely send it to an appraiser because the thing is, we, we sit in our, um, in our little room or we have our regular equipment with us um, and we're used to looking at things and anything that doesn't look like what we're used to looking at, um, it, it just sings at you. Okay, Dave, about yourself, what do you think? I get people all the time that have gotten to the stage where they're ready to buy something and they still have doubts. And you can ask questions on a forum and you'll get lots of different opinions. But a lot of times, those opinions are not necessarily qualified ones. And it just be, it becomes more and more confusing. At that point, where you really are committed to buying and you have one or two or three things that are left to you to choose from, that's the point where you probably need somebody to give you some guidance. Not necessarily somebody involved in the uh, business deal, but somebody from outside. And that's when you put the tools down and you stop thinking with your wallet and you just say, I want the nicest one here. Uh, and I'll say, well, what is the most important element of what you're buying? Is it, is it really romantic and you don't care what it is? It's just a gift. Or are you trying to get to the, uh, the best color or the best cut, or a great combination. And then I'll look at what, what they have and try to make a uh, kind of a King Solomon sort of decision. Uh, and that is something that you can't buy in a store and you can't take it with you. That's what an expert's for. That's great advice. In fact, so I suppose it's not too surprising that the uh, post-millennial generation guys are all essentially saying it, it can be gut. Um, I, I really reinforce what Gary's saying about not just the clarity, but if the deal seems to be too good to be true, it's probably worth your, your way to find your way to, to an appraiser. Um, yeah. And the same thing, if, if you're questioning, if you're confused, it's a good idea. I would also say anything that is high value for your budget. 
Uh, and the last piece that I would tag on to that is this. Any person that you're working with, if you volunteer that you would like to have your, your professional consult done, and that's on your dime, and that person shows any resistance to it, it's a good sign to walk away. Yeah. Uh, last thing, last item. What are some common mistakes uh, or assumptions beginners might make with the basics, like uh, loops and gauges and things like that? Well, loops, uh, buy a cheap loop that doesn't do a good job is pretty much a waste of time. Uh, if you buy a 10x loop that's only 5x, that isn't real good. If you buy a loop that, that isn't uh, corrected so that it doesn't, that it only works in the center of the lens, it's a very difficult loop to use. Uh, the ones that uh, are high value, high quality loops uh, give you a good view through almost the entire lens across the lens. Uh, there's a lot of different gauges to estimate the sizes of, of stones. And I mean, I, I have this little gauge that I carry all the time and it gives, but I cut off all the bigger ones all the way around here. I cut them off so that I don't misuse the tool, but up to about 65 points, it's somewhat accurate. And then I have a, a different kind of tool that, that's no longer made, which I just think is a great tool. And I'm gonna hold it up against a, uh, a background. I think I have it spelled out here. It was called the millimeter. Hmm. I can't read it. Is it, is it sp saying the word? Yeah. Do I have it in the right direction or backwards? I think I have it right. Uh, it has measurements and it's transparent. And you can put it over diamonds and it comes in all different shapes. <laughs> air shaped baguette, tapered baguette, uh, oval, uh, some emerald cuts, marquee. And you can estimate with some degree of accuracy uh, the approximate sizes of smaller diamonds that are in mounted items, in mounted pieces. And it's way better than guessing. Mm. Eric? Um, a simple trick. Um, when you are trying to estimate the carat weight of a diamond, um, you can go online, you can get all sorts of formulas for all sorts of stones. But oh, yeah. almost all of those formula formulas underestimate the size of the diamond. Most of the charts slightly overestimate the weight of the diamond, but if you do have an accurate millimeter measuring system, um, and so you measure the, uh, two, the, the smallest and the greatest diameter of a round diamond, so, so you get 6.4 by 6.3 millimeters, and your depth comes up at around about um, 3.9, 3.95, something like that. <coughs> um, and you use one of those formulas for estimation, they usually don't allow enough for the girdle. So if you are into doing that sort of thing, if you're a bit of a collector and you're buying um, secondhand stones, I like the formula um, diameter times diameter times 0 0.00625 times the depth. You write that down, 0 0.00625. That is the most accurate because it accommodates for the girdle. Most of those formulas want you to add something for girdle or for colored gemstones, for bulge, for the, the fat bottoms, the natural gems. So um, that's, and the other thing is that if your estimation comes up to 95 points or 98 points, almost all diamonds are cut to one carat. Almost all diamonds are cut to two carat. There aren't 1.9 carat diamonds. There aren't 99 point diamonds. They don't exist. Okay. That's pretty good insight. Uh, my own advice would be, uh, it's, it's moving from a loop to a scope, but, but many people, including jewelry professionals, if you're pursuing cut quality, they confuse what a hearts and arrows viewer is uh, with a tool like Ideal Scope or, or Asset or one of the, the um, light performance scopes. So it's a really good idea to have that very well defined um, yourself. And if you're dealing with a jewelry professional, just do understand that sometimes they, they don't know the difference. It's an honest mistake. 
but uh, the, the general difference is that uh, a hearts and arrows viewer, precision viewer, will generally have an elevated stage or a white at the top. It's, it's not trying to create a proper obstruction metric generally. And in my opinion, the best uh, light performance tools have backlighting. They use that white phone screen underneath for, for analysis. Um, but we have gone through an hour really fast here. And I uh, really appreciate, first of all, uh, appreciate everybody who's participating and who has sent these great questions in. I want to thank my colleagues, Andre and Gloria and the rest of the Price Scope team for facilitating. Um, and of course, my dear friends, Dave and Gary, uh, who have become regulars for these sessions. Uh, we hope you enjoy them. Really like to shout out to the Price Scope sponsors. Once again, if you go to the uh, Price Scope resources and find our, our featured uh, sponsors and vendors. Um, they really do a lot for us and in uh, doing so they help us bring you these webinars. You can look for this session on demand later. Uh, like to thank you. We will go ahead and leave the chat up for a few moments for those who want to capture links. Otherwise, have a great day and a great weekend ahead. Goodbye. Hooray.